Hello, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to the Celebration of Seeds workshop. Thank you all for joining us. Um, we're each going to tell you a little bit about the way we express our love for seeds today, and then hopefully we'll have some time at the end for you all to either ask questions or share some stories of your own. Ready? Okay. My name is Lori McKenzie, and I work for Organic Seed Alliance. We're a nonprofit based out of Port Townsend, Washington. And I'm a plant breeder, and I do research and education for OSA. So seed is very close to my heart. And I got started in seed when I worked at uh, Gathering Together Farm, and I met Frank Morton. I turned around one day at lunch to Frank, and I said, I like you. And he looked at me, and he said, why? <laughs> Uh, and I said, I don't really know. You just have a nice energy about you. And that was my introduction into seed and got me set on this pathway. So I want to tell you about why I think seeds are amazing or some of the things I think are amazing about them. And probably these bullet points on the slide are of no surprise to any of you. There's a lot of reasons to save seed. So I'm not really going to go through these because my absolute most favorite reason to save seed is because I think seeds are magical. And I am reminded of this every single spring when I do transplants or when I plant anything and you see that first little lip of green coming out from your soil. It just feels like living magic every single time, especially if you have the, um, the wonderful fortune to be around children and children and seeds and the enthusiasm and the excitement that children express and feel when they too see those seeds first growing. One of the things I encounter very often in my line of work in my discussions are you can't save seed from a hybrid. And I am all about people saving seeds. I even heard of some, I can't remember the breeder, but there's a pepper out there. It's a jalapeno and it's called pizza pepper. And the story is that that seed was found in the salad bar in a, like a Papa John's or something. And this breeder thought, I really like this pepper. So he took some of the seed home from the salad bar and did a breeding project out of it. This is an example of a breeding project that Frank Morton did at Wild Garden Seed, and it's a dehybridization or a breeding out of a hybrid project. And it was a variety called La Paris, which is no longer available. And it was a red roasting pepper, and these are only eight of the examples of, I think, what is now about 11 varieties that Frank has bred out of this pepper. So when people say to me, oh, you can't save seed from hybrid, it won't grow, or um, that's, I, often, I will always counter with nine times out of 10, that's not true. There are some situations where you're not gonna get pollen out of a hybrid, but generally speaking, you're just gonna embark on a breeding project. And sometimes those breeding projects can be astounding. Sometimes they can be very frustrating and they can lead to a dead end. Frank got exceptionally lucky starting with a gold mine of a pepper, but I always like to use this as an example of um, how amazing that endeavor can be. So when I was thinking about what I love about seeds and what I want to celebrate about seeds with you all today, I thought about biology. And I'm a scientist at heart, and I grew up with a dad and a big garden and a family who was outdoors a lot. And so the more I learn about plants, the more I find them amazing and spectacular. And uh, the biology has become more and more magical as I learn more about it. So I'm sure these are terms that most of you are familiar with, things that self-pollinate, being pollinating and fertilizing themselves. I learned in my adult life that pollination and fertilization are actually two separate events. And then cross-pollinated plants openly share their pollen, pollen to fertilize plants other than themselves. Some of the things I think are really cool about self-pollinating plants, they will always have perfect flowers. So they're always gonna have both pistillate and anthers. Uh, they've got the male and the female parts so they can do all the work themselves. And I learned uh, just a few years ago, someone said to me, if you don't know if a plant is self-pollinating or cross-pollinating, one of the biological clues is how close together the stigma and the anther are. And the closer they are together, the more likely it is self-pollinated, which makes sense because you're more likely to get your own pollen on your own stigma and on your own style if your parts are close together. And self-pollinating plants have kind of figured it out. So they've figured out their genetic package that works so they put a lot of energy and they make these big, beautiful seeds and they don't make a lot of them. So if you're looking at a plant and it has relatively few seeds, given the, the size and breadth of the plant, and the seeds are really big, you're probably looking at something that's self-pollinated or fairly strongly self-pollinated. And oftentimes the petals remain closed. So this is a fava. 
I believe it's a Diana Faba if you're into uh, variety specifics. And the flower, although it remains closed, it has a fused keel, so it's very difficult for insects to get in there. It has a lot of visual cues that draw pollinators to it, right? It's got that dark spot in the middle that basically is a landing strip saying, come here and visit me. And we don't often think of self-pollinating crops and flowers as needing visits from pollinators, but they benefit a lot from it. If you can imagine a big bee or a surfed fly or something and coming landing on you and the weight of them kind of shaking your flower as it lands or um, bumblebees that buzz pollinate tomatoes and they'll cling onto the flower upside down and they'll buzz it and the pollen will actually fall out onto their bellies. So that's moving the pollen around even inside of those fused stru structures. Now cross-pollination on the other hand, uh, I put all flower orientations, I'm sure some of you know what this means, um, if you want to have more of a biology discussion about what monoecious and dioecious flowers are, come find me later. So these flowers can be either perfect or dioecious or monoecious, and these have their stigma and the anther farther apart. Um, those of you who know me know this is one of my favorite plants here on your left. This is Phacelia. And Phacelia is one of my favorite examples of something that's very, very obviously cross-pollinated because the anthers are like this. They're way out there and they're purple, which is a very attractive color. They smell good. So it's an exceptionally attractive plant to insects, which are going to come and move that pollen around. On the flip side of that, cross-pollinators can also have very, very inconspicuous and hard to see flowers. And those are generally wind-pollinated crops. So they have very few flowers, but they have lots and lots of pollen. So if you happen to brush up against them or intentionally swat them when they're in their pollen dehiscence and pollen release, you get this cloud of pollen, and it's really fun. Um, one thing I did not put in here, but in, in a, uh, opposition to the relatively few and big seeds that a self-pollinator will make, a cross-pollinating crop will make a lot of little seeds. So each of those seeds is a slightly different genetic package and has a slightly better or worse chance in the next year depending on what kind of weather we get, depending on what kind of climate it is, whether we have a warm or a wet or a dry. So the that plant is basically guaranteed to have some genetic package that meets the requirements and meets the climate of that next year no matter what. So it produces a lot of seeds and they're pretty little. So some of my favorite visual examples of what I just told you, again, you have Phacelia that's that great example of something that is just reaching out for pollinators. And then on the bottom left, you have a sweet pea and that's that fused keel making it impossible for insects to get in. And of course, they drill in and they do some work and they steal some pollen and they get in there anyways. And then the one on the top is a pepper. And that one's really interesting to me because it's white. Uh, the solanaceas are really fun because as you go from tomato to, to pepper to eggplant, is that right? The flowers get bigger uh, and you get more cross-pollination. So as your flower size increases, you're also looking at something that's generally more cross-pollinating. So this is a white flower, but it's got bright purple pollen. And that's, again, a really attractive color and kind of that landing strip uh, to bring the pollinators in. And smell is another way of attracting insects, especially to those self-pollinators like sweet peas that smell really good but are very self-pollinated. But that activity that it's drawing in from the pollinators is helping ensure that it's getting full pollination inside that flower structure. So even when something's really self-pollinated, like this is a tomato, and the tomato on the left, they, tomatoes have a fused anther cone, and that's part of what helps them be very self-pollinated is the stigma and the stigmatic surface are actually below the top of that anther cone. So the anther cone, as it kind of shakes around or you know, gets knocked around in the wind or by insects, that pollen just sort of sifts down and lands right on its own, own stigma, but not all tomatoes are like that. The one on the right has an exerted stigma, and you see exerted stigmas more often in cherry tomatoes and more often in heirloom tomatoes. So if you are saving seeds, and you're saving seeds of a cherry or an heirloom, and they're close together, and you've got a lot of biological activities, and you've got a lot of pollinators on your farm, you might get a lot of cross-pollination that you're not expecting. So you can look for these, and even the flowers will be different 
Sometimes the early flowers are more or less exerted in comparison to the later flowers or the mid-season flowers. So even when you think you know what's going on, sometimes nature will be tricky. I also love color change. And color change, especially as a seeds person, gives you so much information about what's going on in the plant. So these are carrot seeds, and they're going from you know, new and young to ready and ripe. And as they deepen and darken into that brown color, you know, browns, yellows, kind of the oranges, those are the colors of seed maturity. And uh, it's just a beautiful transition. This is another one of my favorite seed friends. This is spinach. And I love that spinach gives us color change in multiple ways. The seeds change from green to brown, the leaves change from green to brown, and the stem changes from green to yellow. So it's talking to us and letting us know what's going on. You also see color change on the outside of fruits, right? Fruits often go from shiny, like eggplants, to dusky once they're in full seed maturity. Same thing with squash. And of course, we all know the baseball-sized zucchini. They often get a lot bigger. And then, of course, there's foods that we love to eat. Uh, and we eat them in the state that they are also mature in seed. So this is a really fun one I tell people a lot. Like, if you bring a tomato home from the market and you really like it, it's really easy to save the seed as you eat it and as you enjoy it. And I think that's a really special thing that a lot of people don't think of very often. And seeds are the foundation of our food. And they're not only the foundation of our food, they're also the foundation of our fabric. They're the foundation of our oils. They're the foundation of so much in our lives. And we often take that for granted. We don't think too much about the fact that we're wearing cotton, and cotton comes from a plant. And cotton, although cotton is actually a perennial plant, we grow it like an annual for, I'm not a cotton breeder or a cotton aficionado, but um, that's the way we do our, our production, in the States at least, for cotton. So I think there's a lot of ways that seeds touch our life every day that we don't think of too much. And it's really amazing to me when you think about what a profound impact they have on us. They truly are the foundation of our lives. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Don Tipping. Many of you know Don from Siskiyou Seeds down in eastern not Eastern, sorry, Southern Oregon. I can't think and do this at the same time. And he is going to tell us about uh, his farm and his relationship with seeds. Definitely an honor to follow such a, um, just a great distillation of how reproductive biology works in flowering plants. So now that we've, we've gotten kind of the lowdown, we're going to get the, um, a broader perspective. Um, and I, I wanted to share this, this little bit of a reading from a, one of my favorite uh, people that's able to put um, the human experience into words. And if you want to join me, I can't read with my eyes closed, but you could close your eyes and just okay. let um, some of the day fall away for a moment. This is from the Huahu Jing from Lao Tzu. Ten. The ego is a monkey capitulating through the jungle totally fascinated by the realm of the senses. It swings from one desire to the next, one conflict to the next, one self-centered idea to the next. If you threaten it, it actually fears for its own life. Let this monkey go. Let the senses go. Let desires go. Let conflicts go. Let ideas go, let the fiction of life and death go. Just remain in the center watching, and then forget you are there. So I'm a bit of an armchair physicist, if you will. And um, if we adhere to uh, some of the rules of quantum physics, uh, in which there's this emergent field of quantum biology. And in a quantum physics world, the, the word can't doesn't exist. It's just we haven't pinned down the exact mechanics of how that works. So I think it's really important to understand, like, wow, there we are. You know, like when you look up in the sky, there's a maximum 4,000 stars you can see, which is just a very small radius around where our sun is. And uh, 
from this, this recent work of uh, Dr. Uh, Gerard Pollack, an amazing work of, uh, there's a new book called The Fourth State of Water, and it's being hailed as the most important scientific discovery in the last hundred years. And it's the idea that water not only inhabits a, a solid, a liquid, and a gas, but also a fourth stage, and it actually explains a lot of the how our, our physical universe works. So another aspect of that, and that why I want to bring us to the sun, is that our eyes actually have receptors for infrared light, much like plants do. We can't see infrared light, but we actually feed on it. So, and then when we think of this fourth stage of water that I, I'll spare you the, the more detailed complexity of it all, but it, basically it's the way that water is, functions like a battery and it works with infrared light and there's this new understanding, this is a man who's a scientist at Washington State University um, and it's very peer reviewed, this isn't, uh, you know, fringe stuff is that water is a battery and it uses infrared light and this is what actually drives most metabolic processes in the known living world. And this new awareness around water is really important to understand. And if we all remember, what's the first element of the periodic chart? Anyone? Hydrogen. hydrogen. Very small. So water is like a lot of hydrogen. Um, so we've all heard the saying that we are like 70% water. But water molecules are so small that it, by molecular count, we are 99% water. Wow. And so when we think of plants and all the life that we're interacting with, it's, it's about this. And yet we tend to focus on water as this, oh, yeah, yeah, it's over there. It's like an input. It's like one element in the system. Same with sunlight, you know, photosynthesis, when we think about the total miracle of that. So then, you know, honing into like, okay, that's cool, Don. Where are we? Here's where we are. This is actually where we are. This is, you know, the watersheds of the Continental Divide West. And we, I think we really need to begin viewing through the lens of water. If we're 99% water, let's start looking at the world as if it's land, but more water, because we're way more water. So once we begin to function like that, then I think a lot of the problems with our, you know, the mechanical view we have of the, the, the world will, will fall away. So, Here's Cascadia. I don't know if you're some, somewhere else. I don't know what it's called. But basically, this is our bioregion. Um, and I happen to live down in the state of Jefferson, which is like a political secessionist movement <laughs> down there. Um, and I think, I think we very well possibly in our lifetime will see uh, you know, the breakdown of political boundaries and into watershed boundaries and begin to function more this way. And I, I really, uh, I think for the hope of the seeds and the plants and all the other you know, biota that we share this, uh, this creation with that we, we do that quickly. I, re I really like this understanding because, uh, you know, and, and then and I'm grateful to have this time here, this space. There's a lot of really smart white guys here. And there's even more smart women here. So I want to just be this, you know, just somebody that is, is expressing, you know, the, my gratitude for having been able to be in a garden for the last 25 years as my primary activity. And, uh, and the peace that comes along with that. You know, and then to go back to, uh, anybody ever read, uh, there's a book by Gary Nabham called Where Our Food Comes From. Anybody read that? Foundational reading. This is Teosinte, Zia Mexicana. It's one of the, uh, you know, it's, it is the ancestor of corn, you know, one of the, the staple crops that gave birth to civilization. In that book, uh, Gary Nabham makes the claim that 99% of our agricultural um, domestication occurred before 300 years ago. So what we've achieved in the last 300 years amounts to less than 1%. So let that sink in as you look at the superiority of the biotech uh, jargon. And just grasp that they turned this thing that you can't even eat. Like those are just these tiny little triangular, those are immature there. We, it's hard for us to get it to mature where we're at because it's day length sensitive. Um, we turn that into canola oil, you know, and all of these products. So, and that's, that's a fascinating way to view culture too is the interconnection between seed. And I've, I've been thinking about this lately, like what is civilization? It's food, air, you know, water, soil, water, air, and seeds. You take away, that's the table. Those are the legs of the table that support all of civilization. You take away any one of those, civilization fails. 
So those of us engaged in seed, not to pull some like superiority trip or anything, but we're, we're there trying to like, hey, we're trying to hold this whole thing up. The, the big tent of it all. And uh, my good friend Bill McDormand has pointed out that here on the planet, there's rice people, corn people, and wheat people. And those have been the primary civilizations. We may argue potatoes and quinoa if you, you know, go down to the Andes, but we think about it. That, you know, this one here, it, it lifted us out of hunter-gatherer existence and into civilization and the whole flowering of what's occurred from that. You know, and then, so we, from that plant, noticed all the different myriad of forms that we were able to take this grain, this grass, into just like a, 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 an incredible diversity of colors, shapes, uses, interactions, stories, songs, you know, and then all the, the noticing of, of those interactions of what is occurring there between light and water and the minerals in the soil. And, and then, you know, and then how it affected individuals. This is Carl Barnes, who was a Cherokee farmer who recently passed away, and he was instrumental in pulling together the germplasm that resulted in glass gem corn, you know, that really kind of became this whole internet uh, sensation. But I think it's important to always, behind the sea, there's always a human being that's there with their creativity and their imagination noticing something. And I think that is a, 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 a really unique part of being a seeds person, is that when you're growing most crops, you are, you're kind of, you're like a cover band playing, you know, songs somebody else wrote. But when you get in there like Carl did, or many of us, you're like a, a singer-songwriter coming up with your own material, something totally new that's never occurred before, like something that you saw and you're teasing it out. I like that. And, you know, and, and, and we think about it, like cover bands, they're kind of oftentimes destined to just like playing bars. You don't get paid very well. But it's the, it's the singer-songwriters that really captivate our heart and our soul and our passion that encourage us, I want to I want to be an artist too. I want to, you know, share my song. And that that comes in many forms. This is a uh, painted hill sweet corn that was painted mountain flower corn crossed with uh, golden bantam sweet corn. Uh, Alan Capular crossed those two and now it's still kind of squirrely and wild, but it's a, you know, multicolored sweet corn. Uh, this is a, a Grex we've created called River Spirit Rainbow that's kind of like our uh, long season version of painted mountain. Instead of ears like this, it's ears like this, because we can. Um, and then, you know, that deeper level of inquiry into it, you know, the, the craft of the singer-songwriter isn't just like, oh, I have some cool ideas, I'm going to make a song. You, you, you have to learn the chords, you have to learn the melody, and all this. So, like, what I've been really learning, and I'm really interested in this, is, like, what, besides saying, what do I know about seed, what can the seed teach me? You know, so every time we do the germination test, I try and, I try and like maybe put on the teacher's cap, but really I'm like, I have no idea what's going on here. Come look at it with me and ask lots of questions. So I, you know, try and bring the people that work with me or our students on the farm and look at, like, look at those roots. What, what's going on there? What does that tell us about what those, those corn plants are potential? And we're just looking at a tiny little lens. There's four varieties there. Can you go back? Yes. So one thing I want to point out in this picture, tell me if I'm right, the one on the far right is Top Hat, is yeah. it not? Yeah. Which is, from, which is from Lupin Knoll Farm, bred by Jonathan Spiro, who's just down the road from you. So this is the corn that was bred in the great state of Jefferson, and it appears to me to be one of the best ones in that picture. Yeah. But Hopi Blue, too, like we're up there in Oregon, or you know, down from here. Growing Hopi Blue, but the way the, you know, the Hopi people planted it was, you know, 10 inches deep in sandy soil, and that, that root couldn't fan out in the sand. It would die in the, you know, in the heat and the dry. It needed to auger down. So again, that adaptation, like we may have this incredible agrobiodiversity, but really these crops all, all like imprinted on this very unique bioregional adaptation. So... And that's where I think we can see that if, if we're willing to be open and to have that level of inquiry and just and play around like, what are we seeing? And this is this Cassiopeia mix. And every year we play around with uh, it's a popcorn. I had it at the seed swap yesterday. Um, and here's that top hat corn. This is over at uh, Wandering Fields Farm. They're doing seed production uh, for uh, Jonathan Spiro for Lupin Knoll Farm. And that's a open pollinated white sweet corn 
excellent uniformity and adaptation. Here's our Hopi blue, which sometimes I'm wondering, like, what would the Hopi people think of all this? And, and I've been really trying to understand that whole I idea from my position as an Irish, Russian, Polish, displaced human being born in Detroit, Michigan. If I'm going to call it Hopi, is it, what do the Hopi think of that? And I have a, an interesting story about, um, oh, what, what just happened there? Pardon me for a second. Um, we'll get back to it. Um, oh, but that's just gonna open one. I know. Well, I guess maybe this just gives me pause to tell the story. That I, I had this Apache red su sweet corn, just pardon me for a, as I get back to where I was, that I got from the old Seeds of Change vault. And that's all I knew about it, was that it was this uh, you know, pretty corn, deep dark red, that was called Apache Red. So I, I went online and I researched all about the Apache people and I found the phone numbers for the uh, White Mountain Apache Reservation and I called 23 different phone numbers before I finally got somebody that was like, yeah, we don't have an agriculture department anymore. You know, here's the water department, the casino department, the human resources department. And eventually somebody was like, well, you know, and I, eventually I got a little frustrated. I was like, you know what, on your website, you guys say that you're the people that brought corn into North America. You don't even have anybody on your whole thing who can tell me if this corn is legit, if it's like, okay. So they're like, there's this old guy, Ramon Rodriguez, that works over at the water department. Because I'd grown it out and it was very diverse and I was wanting to know if it's called Apache Red, what, how do you want it to be? So if maybe one of your people gets it and they grow it, that it looks like what their ancestors told them it should be. So Ramon told me this whole story that his grandma had raised him with these stories that they were the Roadrunner clan and they were keepers of the black corn. And I was like, bingo, you know, that's all I needed. The black corn, the really dark, dark, dark red. That's what Apache red will be. And then I created multiple other strains out of all the other interesting segregation because nobody had maintained it, interestingly. But what I, why I bring that story is up is that as we take on this role of seed stewards, I think one of the really important things is that, uh, like from the Hopi uh, corn that we saw, one of the Hopi teachings is that there's these like kind of sacred instructions that are like on tablets, much like the uh, Ten Commandments or something, but they're broken in half. And then the people, one person has to go around the whole planet. Oh, thanks. And, and they meet on the other side and then they recombine the tablets and that's the spiritual instructions and that's a bit of the prophecy around like the situation that we're in right now. A lot of us only have partial instructions. So with that Apache red, that somewhere there's like this echo of what that corn and all it symbolized and what it meant for those people as the sole source of their sustenance so that maybe a few generations lapsed between when it was grown uh, you know, regularly and used as a daily food. And when maybe some young person, there's this whole repatriating indigenous food crops movement going on right now. And among some indigenous people, they're, they're doing this pre-colonial diet where they only eat foods that were present before colonial uh, situations occurred. So, but we wanna make sure that echo is the same as the song that created it way back. And I think that that's one of the really important things that we carry amidst the, the, the modern constraints we have of yield and uniformity and economics and just some of the realities that we're faced with. So I, I guess I just share that. Like, so here's from that corn, the super dark one, but we also got all these other colors. And are they wrong? They're still beautiful, it's all food. So, and then I always find it really interesting. This is my friend Glenda who is Ecuadorian woman who came up and studied uh, with us during our seed academy, you know, and so it comes from this rich agricultural tradition, but it had been broken for a few generations, and she had came from Detroit as a food activist to come study with us, and now she's back with her grandma in Ecuador, sharing the teaching she learned from a bunch of hippies in Oregon <laughs> about how to fix the broken parts of their food system. You know, so we're, we're just, we stand at this really interesting place uh, in the human evolution. And corn, I think, is a, a, a really amazing teacher in that, and genetics. Like, what a cool, like, look at there, you got, like, 
different male pollinizers and all sorts of stuff with, I'll spare you all about pericarp and alurone and mm -hmm. maternal genetics and, and jumping genes and triploid genetics. And, and I think it is really cool to dive into that kind of stuff and use some of these things as a living laboratory for teaching this because then if you can understand that but also understand uh, my friend Walter Goldstein, anybody have a chance to, Walter Goldstein has a uh, nitrogen fixing corn. He won't claim that, but in like big field trials in Wisconsin, that's his only conclusion. He also has a corn where he crossed in a land race from a Mexican corn where it will not receive GMO pollen. It has a gene that just like, it won't go in. So, and the way he believes that this occurs, and we're talking about, Walter's a scientist and has all the like, you know, molecular biology breakdowns of all this stuff, is that there's some level of magic occurring and he doesn't quite understand what it is. And, you know, so I, I want to, like, that we can't rule that out, you know, so then we've got the wheat people, and I've been really trying to dive into working with some of Luther Burbank's varieties, more just to learn, like, how did you do that? <laughs> what, what did you see? You know, here's a hollis black barley. And I think in doing that, and I've been working a lot with uh, Dr. Alan Kapular's work, and obviously Frank Morton's, and, and through one another, it's sort of like before you become a singer-songwriter, you've got to learn how to play some Beatles songs, okay. some Grateful Dead songs, a Bob Dylan song or two, a Joni Mitchell song, so that then your own unique repertoire has all of the, uh, you know, the, the cool elements. Uh, this is a, a kamut um, that's a, a Karosan wheat. It's an ancient variety. It gets about five, six feet tall. Uh, quinoa is something that we've been really exploring. We maintain about ten different types of quinoa. I believe this is Frank Morton's uh, redhead. Um, and, you know, and breeding adaptation for some of these things. And ultimately, I am realizing, I think a lot of this stuff that we do with seed, it's like, well, the seed is cool. The seed is ultimately really cool. But if we think about what are we as human beings that are water and photons, ultimately, that's mostly what we are, temporarily inhabiting molecules, it's about the relationships and the interconnectivity and how can we in the short lifetime make the best use out of this experience to be able to you know, use that little bit of battery so that you can somehow advance the, the experiment of human consciousness. You know, and that's from an anthroposophic understanding. That is the role of humanity, is we, like the domesticated animals, have offered themselves up in service of humankind to advance the evolution of consciousness. You know, so that's one thing I ponder a lot. And when I do the germination test, I used to... Um, have some of my crew help with it. So I have my crew help start it, but I sit and score every single one. I think we did over 800 this year, because I realize if all that information is going in through me, like we have our, our, our capacity for observation is vast. They've recently identified the human sense of smell can identify a trillion different smells. I mean, that's so, that's vast. And our sense of smell isn't even our most significant one. Our eye, receives 85% of the information that all of our senses take in. The phoema is F-O-E-M-A, is the part of our eye that does detail-oriented, like reading. If, and that represents 1% of the surface of our eye that's exposed to light. If our whole eye surface was as detail-oriented as the phoema, our brain would have to be 5,000 times as large. <laughs> So like, don't underestimate the power of what your senses are doing. And definitely spare yourself from taking in information that's not healthy or <laughs> encouraging you to do the right thing. Because if we you know, focus that, we have one, one of the things that I, I'm hoping uh, you know, I can come across. I just wanted to give token acknowledgment to beans because they're so cool and um, the pulses. But this image, like I was reading the germination test this year and, and I kind of got this message. I began to notice this thing because I always had this idea like, oh, well, the newer seeds are more vital and they'll just they'll always grow and sprout faster. But then it wasn't until I was, I was there with my son. This is, he's 14, born and raised there and he's helping me with this project. And we're looking through the tomato ones and I got all excited and I was trying to show him about it. Those tobacco seeds, tiny, tiny seeds. Um, and there's a, there's a radish. I think those are two or three days old. 
Um, but I was looking at the tomato seeds, and we grew a lot. We did a tomato trial with like about 120 varieties this year, and we're really screening a lot of material from uh, from mushroom. A lot of the interesting uh, crosses he'd made. There's uh, these interesting centiflor strains that have like 100 flowers. Um, and also from Brad Gates. Anybody ever grown any Brad Gates Wild Boar Farms tomatoes? God, yeah, mad scientist, cool. Uh, so we were evaluating a lot of this material, so I was looking at a lot of German tests of fresh tomato seed. But that, tomato seed, for those of you who have good storage conditions, it, it can maintain viability for a long time, like eight, 10 years, actually, if you got it right. And what the tomato seeds told me, if I could say it as such, because it wasn't in language, was basically the older ones like, hey, we sprouted because we thought we got to grow. What are you, what are you doing? And it was this interesting kind of thing. I was like, well, you're not supposed to be as vigorous as the fresh ones because you, you've been in storage for a while. But it was almost as if they were like, well, we're ready to grow. And, I, you know, I'm making my little note. Like, I know, I know. It's been a while. We're, we'll grow you out this year. Don't worry. But I had this awareness of, for one, that there's way more going on here. And then in doing this germination test process, I also realized from... Um, not to go too far out on a limb, uh, but it, from anthroposophy, from the, you know, the old Akashic understanding, from the European kind of like spiritual understanding of the cosmos, there's this idea of like all uh, of humanity has four basically layers to it. The mineral, the etheric that we share with plants, the astral that we share with animals. When we're dreaming, we're in our astral, and humans have the ego, the I individuality. I realized in doing the germination test, I was actually creating a farm in the etheric, planting 800 varieties just to see, like, will you grow? And then I just feed it all to the chickens. But I realized that that is actually like a spiritual meditation so that the seeds that we offer out there, like, I know these will grow. I've already seen it. I've already seen this 800 variety farm in micro that has the vitality that I know will grow. And I realized that, like, that, that there's actually an old biodynamic practice where you bury your seeds in a, some kind of vessel for the, uh, the 12 holy nights around Christmas. And I realized that the seedsman's or seed woman's role of doing the germination test is very much like our modern version of that, of like rekindling our hope and faith in the seed's ability to continue life, you know, because without that, we, we wouldn't have life for very long at least. And then, I mean, of course, there's always always just the, you know, the fun weirdness of it all. You know, what these look like little snakes um, and onion seed and then things that break the rules and uh, squash. This is actually, Rob, because you're here in the office, this is my stabilization of sunshine that we talked about years ago. So we're, you know, multiple years into it. And then it, there's this element of chaos that we're embracing that is out there in the field, you know, that we're bringing down to this order, this, this like distilled thing. But this is kind of what it looks like. I feel embarrassed. Hopefully others have this too. Like when I'm doing farm tours it, from like mid-July on, because certain parts of the field look like we're growing weeds mm -hmm. to the untrained eye. And I'm like, no, no, it's supposed to be like that. <laughs> you know, and all these oddball things that we experience and just all those things that take place out in the field. And, you know, as I was talking about kind of like, uh, you know, one, one of the things Steiner said that it's like to, under, to think that we can understand the complexity of nature just through the, the physical senses is a very limited worldview. There's so much more going on there. You know, there's photons, there's all of this gas exchange, pollination, uh, you know, so many interactions. You know, here's a lettuce that's bolting or not, both planted on the same day. Um, and just so much variation and stuff that it's kind of beyond what we can take in. So we ultimately need to compel ourselves thanks, with that kind of right brain uh, process uh, to, to inquire more deeply of what is occurring here. You know, what, um, how is this taking place? <laughs> you know, and then the others, somehow they have their own unique way. I would not choose to harvest lettuce seed naked, but these two gentlemen <laughs> decided that was a good idea. Uh, it's pretty scratchy and dusty and latexy, if, um, you know, and, and all the all the things that go on, and, and that's this, you know, image really underscores something very significant for me, is that ultimately, why do we grow seeds? Well, to grow plants. Well, why do we grow plants? To raise human consciousness. So, like, well, 
And we can't short circuit it. We can't just go right to education. We need to do it through the vehicle of seed. So here's you know a young man on my farm, in year four, and you know and our dogs that are a crucial element of our whole farm biological system, and you know so that we're we're ultimately growing human beings, you know through all of this. And how is that process occurring? And you know, and like here's Jonathan Spear. I don't know if he's in the audience or Jesse. I, I, you can't read his shirt, but it says, uh, uh, we are dawning in the age of asparagus. <laughs> and this is breeding the uh, solstice broccoli and, and just, you know, the level of passion he gets. And that's where I'm like, you know, part of you, I want you to pay attention to what he's saying about broccoli, but just check out how turned on this dude is about plants. And that's, you know, be like that. And, uh, you know, and how do we mentor people? This is uh, Barry's Crazy Cherry. It's a really unique uh, center floor type uh, cherry tomato from Brad Gates. And again, you know, and then the young people that come through our farm, of which we've probably had hundreds over the, the years now, um, that go on to, you know, take on some element of, uh, you know, what they're doing out there. So this is processing some tomato seed. Here's, and, and then just our, the in, how the inquiry never stops. I think that's a key thing. I, I hope everybody goes away with this. Is and and as every time, I believe it's the second law of thermodynamics. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. So as bad as the biotech, GMO, synthetic biology world is, it's equally good in the other direction and everywhere in between. So if we think that Monsanto is going to screw up our food supply, of like, well, who was eating goldenberry 20 years ago? Any of us? Now it's like in all the natural food store. Who was eating quinoa? Who was eating cacao nibs? Who was eating all these foods? Our agrobiodiversity was begin to embrace it. It, you know, I'm not worried. It's more like I'm worried that we won't be able to really like, you know, dig into the juiciness of this whole experience. This is uh, for those of you that have been in the Andes, uvia. It's a really high phytonutrient, cool little husk tomato, Cape gooseberry, Cherokee purple tomatoes. Uh, and just, you know, and the potential that we hold in our hands. And one of the, the most important things, I, the coolest things about seed is like here, if I could say, hey, Kenny, I've got this kale seed. It's like the best. But I could also have like irradiated dead swag and be like, you know, and they look the same. And that's, you just have to take the faith so that, again, it's the growing human being. Like, who are you? Who, you know, at, do, are you that in integrity and in truth and all those things? Because ultimately, that's all you have in this, in this life. So, so but you know, it, the way we reach that conclusion comes about all these different ways. Here's a kale trial. This is dazzling blue kale um, at, amidst other ones and looking at, uh, you know, how, how all these things come together. And then we get these things at seed swaps and stuff and, you know, through seed sharing. This is uh, stuffing, yellow stuffing tomato. It's, it looks like a bell pepper. But I'd have grown it for years, and I'd never actually done anything cool with it. So there's, uh, you know, yellow stuffing tomato with red currants and walnuts and goat cheese from our goats, and you know, just understanding how does this work? Because this is what we need to pass on to the young people: is the complete picture, not just the seed, but how is it as food? How do you grow it? What? How do we take care of it? Where does it grow? You know, all that that information that goes into how we steward this agrobiodiversity. This is some we have maintained a huge marigold collection. Uh, kind of mushroom was a, a big marigold head, and uh, play around with a lot of it. You, you might not be able to read. This is Casey O'Leary at Snake River Seeds, and her, her hot pepper mix is called the Hotties Mix. <laughs> uh, seed room. I'll just kind of cruise through. We do a lot of uh, seed education in our region and training training new seed growers. Um, and all of this stuff, and including a lot of young people on our farm. And um, I'm really excited to see where all that goes, because it's amidst what we see as a crisis, we also have a tsunami of young people that are not measured in any USDA census at all um, that will be coming to do a lot of this important work. And um, anybody read Frog and Toad? This is my, that's my winnowing chair there. It's a little frog and toad thing that somebody painted and gave to us that said, here are some flower seeds. I don't know if you remember any of that. And just understanding the, the complete system and uh, all the role of all the different life forms. And that's, I really believe strongly in that, the, the agroecology um, that comprises what makes a vital system. Because it's not just the seed, but it's the system on which you grow it that is uh, important. 
This is my uh, new strain of what used to be known as Carmen, I now call Miranda. <laughs> and then I want to leave it with this, and I'll close here. And, um, I was just down in Ecuador, and I, I don't really travel all that much outside of the region, and I brought a bunch of seeds down there, and we were at this market in Saxali, which is like the biggest market in the Andean Highlands, just vast. And uh, we were trading seeds with this woman for this hand-spun, hand-crocheted, cool textiles, like she raised the sheep and everything, and we were bartering the price. and. And then I broke out these seeds. I'm like, do you want to trade seeds for part of it? And all of a sudden, all these old people start coming around. See, you have seeds? And because they're kind of like a, it's like a, they have some pieces of their agrarian heritage together, but it's really broken in a lot of ways too. So just, the, you know, to me, that's, there's a bit of this East meets West, you know, people have these Eagle and Condor and all these different ways of like, we all have an important part of the puzzle and just to remain open-minded to, we don't know how this is going to work out, so we have to have hope. So, thanks. I'm Ken Green. Uh, I'm from the Hudson Valley Seed Company. I also have a nonprofit called Seed Shed, which I might talk a little bit about. Uh, I want to thank uh, Lori for coming up with this idea. Uh, I love it when I'm at a conference or somewhere where there's so much talking about. Uh, the forces of the market and commodities, uh, and that's a really these are really important conversations for us to be having uh, at Organic Ecology. Uh, but I really appreciate having a moment uh, to think a little bit more, uh, dig a little deeper into what we're doing and why we do what we do. So I was not a farmer. Uh, I didn't know anything about where food came from, really, for most of my life. I didn't think about it that much. And uh, I used to work with kids, uh, violent youth. Um, I worked with kids with severe emotional and behavioral problems. Uh, and that's, that's really my background. And when I was finishing my master's in special education, I got a job at my local library, a little, little tiny library, smaller than this room. Uh, and that's what I was doing just to get myself through school. And while I was there, I began meeting farmers. Uh, because where I live in the Hudson Valley in upstate New York, uh, there's lots of small farms and there's actually a lot of small organic farms. So farmers were coming into the library, farm interns were coming into the library, lots of gardeners were coming into the library, and we talked about food and growing a lot. And that was the beginning of my education of thinking about where does food come from? How is food grown? Who grows food? Uh, and starting those relationships. And I uh, started uh, with a group of people, a 100-mile diet through the library, uh, where we tried to challenge ourselves to source all of our food uh, within 100 miles of, are we still good there, uh, of where we lived. And the next year, we tried a 30-mile diet, which we knew we weren't going to be able to get everything. Uh, but the idea was to really learn what can we eat locally and what can't we eat and what, and what does that mean. So those questions were really interesting to me uh, and I started asking those questions about seeds. Where do seeds come from? How are seeds grown? And who grows them and can I meet those people? And I could not get answers, at least satisfactory answers to those questions the way that I could about food. And I have the type of stubborn personality uh, where if I can't get good answers, I'm going to have to find them. Uh, and I get kind of agitated and I can't rest until I start to get answers. So I started doing a lot of reading uh, and research and really started learning about the seed industry. And the two biggest things that really started to get me were uh, the concepts of loss of genetic diversity and consolidation of seed resources. Uh, so I started getting interested in, well, what are our local varieties for the Hudson Valley? Can I still find those varieties? How do I find them? And then what can I do to make sure that those varieties don't disappear? So I started collecting antique seed catalogs uh, to look at what was being grown in New York and the Northeast 60, 100 years ago, and then see if I could find those varieties. This was the first seed catalog that I started my horrible eBay addiction um, to uh, seed catalogs and seed ephemera. 
Uh, so that's a 1914 catalog from Syracuse, New York. Uh, this is a late 1800s catalog. Uh, the early catalogs, the illustrations were slightly scientific, but not entirely. Um, I'm not gonna go into these too much, so we have time for some seed stories. Mills catalog, this is 1914. Uh, I started collecting trading cards. Uh, this is a radish card from Rice Seed Company. The caption says, everybody likes radishes, don't they, Charlie? <laughs> and uh, we did a recaptioning contest for this, and we got hilarious, hilarious submissions. The one that uh, won was a little thought bubble coming out of the taller radish's head that said, I wonder if she knows her roots are showing. <laughs> so that was the winner. Um, this is the 1930s. And what was interesting in the 1930s, there was an explosion of uh, seed companies all over America. Um, lots and lots of new seed companies, lots of seed companies collecting seeds from farmers and gardeners and commercializing them. Uh, and so through the artwork in these catalogs, started to notice a lot of exaggeration. Um, everything's the best and the biggest and the tallest. You know, there's illustrations like this that, you know, I've never seen zinnias that are this tall. We have some antique zinnias that are about up to my nipples, um, but nothing like this, you know. Uh, so it was really interesting to start to see this story unfold through these old catalogs, looking at them in chronological order, um, that our relationship to seeds has changed over time. And you could see that in the pages here. This is 1943. Completely different. Think, if you can, back to that 1914 catalog cover I showed you with the woman and the, she's harvesting the tomatoes and it's beautiful and it's sunset and it's romantic. We're at war. We don't have enough food. So this is a very gritty seed catalog cover. The inside um, page here is about stocking up. So because of what's happening in our world politically and socially, our relationship to food and our relationship to seeds is changing. And you can see that change in relationship through the imagery of this catalog. And this, like, I didn't know this page was going to be in this catalog. I was like, score, this is crazy. So 1940s, top one there says new, silver cross bantam. This is one of the first mentions of hybrid corn um, that I found where they're really pushing it. And at the bottom there, it says very old. Um, but it's a new introduction for American catalogs. This is the first mention of soy that I found in catalogs. And they're predicting two things here, that hybrids are going to take over and that they're going to be what everyone's growing. And they're predicting that soy is going to become one of the world's most important food crops. And they were right. And these are also two of the most genetically engineered. Um, so it's really interesting, you know, to watch this story unfold. So this inspired me to start trying to create a larger timeline of our relationship to seeds. And I started, uh, tried to start 10,000 years ago and work my way forward. It's an ongoing project. Uh, I'm not sure that I'll ever quite um, be done with it. I'm not going to get into it too much. But what I was really curious about is how did we get here? And so this is Phil Howard's uh, visualization, a uh, mapping of the seed industry structure, 1996 to 2013. And the biggest red circles are the uh, corporations that own the most seed resources. So you can see there it's Monsanto, DuPont, Bayer, Dow, Syngenta. Uh, and then this is what's happening now, where we have uh, Monsanto trying to take over Syngenta not being successful with that, Bayer moving in and buying Monsanto, Dow and DuPont merging, and uh, ChemChina buying Syngenta. So this is an unprecedented, overwhelming consolidation of seed resources where three corporations, three mega corporations, are going to hold close to 70% of the seed resources for the planet. Um, so this is the low point of my talk. <laughs> uh, the amazing thing that's happening is, despite all of that overwhelmingly challenging um, consolidation, we also have, I think, a new wave of seed consciousness happening all over the country. So when I started, 
when I was at the library and I got into seeds and I became a seed saver and I added seeds to the library catalog. That was the first seed library in the country. Uh, there was no one else to reach out to, to talk to about why I was having seeds in a library catalog and you could check seeds out. There's over 400 seed libraries all over the country today. Um, so our relationship to seeds continues to change and I see a lot of hope. Uh, and what I want to talk about uh, a little bit more is uh, that because I didn't come from a commodity uh, background and an agricultural background, uh, my approach to seeds has always been cultural and social in nature. Uh, and so when I quit my job at the library, because I was there five days, and then I was like, I need more time at home growing seeds. I was there four days. And eventually, I was at the library one day a week so that I could be in my growing seed garden. The rest of the time, I was like, obviously, I just need to quit my job uh, and figure out if this is what I can do with my life, because I'm completely obsessed. Uh, and luckily, my partner, Doug, who's in the photo here, uh, was crazy enough to quit his job also. Uh, and we quickly learned we couldn't make money and a living running the seed library, so we turned it into a small seed company. But my biggest concern about turning into a seed company was, can I make money selling seeds and do it in a way that's, that matches my ideals, that matches the way that I feel about seeds? And that is about caring for seeds as living beings and not just about turning seeds into a commodity for profit. Uh, so there's a series of questions that Doug and I really asked ourselves when we started out with this about how are we going to care for seeds and how are we going to share them and is there a way to do this responsibly. So this is our um, logo that I created. Uh, we, I had an old logo for the seed library that felt really old at a certain point when we turned into a seed company. And so I love designing logos. I think it's so fun. Um, and I just do like sketches and sketches and sketches. And I was working on this. Nothing was right. Nothing was right. Nothing was right. Hated everything I was coming up with. Uh, there were two bonfires uh, that needed to be burned on the farm. And it was a nice, clear day, no wind. I was like, I'm just going to go out and do the fires and take care of all this stuff. It's a old, where we live is an old Catskill summer resort. There's a lot of shit to burn. <laughs> um, there's some things we can save and there's some things that just need to go away. Uh, so we have periodic bonfires. So I went out, I lit one of the fires, went over to the other bonfire, lit that one. The wind picked up, the fires took off, our normal headwind goes to the back of the property. This one was going the opposite direct direction towards the buildings. The fire's caught. It was a very dry summer this last summer. The weeds caught. The brush started burning. And it was like both fires simultaneously were making a beeline for our brand new office building and our neighbor's house. <laughs> so like, all hands on deck. We got to control the fires. Um, so everyone was out. It took us like six hours of controlling the fires, covered in soot. I, you know, my eyebrows had to grow back. Uh, when we were done, went inside. All my stuff for the logo was, working on the logo was inside my watercolors. And I was just like totally exhausted. Walked in, dipped the brush in the blue paint, made this brush stroke. Not, like didn't even stop, just walking past with the brush stroke. And I was like, that's, that's oh. us right there. So, you know, I wasn't going to share that story, but you really made me think about it because there is something so elemental about being a seed grower. Um, and that almost burning everything down <laughs> and really like being with the fire, um, I think, uh, helped me shed a lot of this other stuff that we think about seeds and you know, consolidation of seed resources and marketing and all of that down to what's important to me about seeds. And, and what's really important to me is thinking about the stories and the artistry. And that's what that logo really is about. So I'm going to share a couple stories about how we work with artists. This is what our seed packs look like. Every pack is by a different artist. And 
I get the comment a lot from people like, oh, your marketing is so amazing, marketing, marketing, marketing. It's like that is not actually, that wasn't the motivation for why I work with artists and why there's artwork on our seed packs. Thinking about that collection of antique seed catalogs, uh, you know, I was doing it for primary documentation. I was doing it for the research. But the experience of turning those pages and seeing the artist's interpretation of the varieties and the way that the artists help tell us the stories of the seeds and the story of our relationship to seeds and food, it, it was just a completely different catalog experience than a modern kind of glossy photography-based catalog. And so I wanted to find a way to continue that tradition of working with artists from those old catalogs without uh, reproducing something old, making it contemporary. Uh, so that's really where the idea came from of working with the artists. And today, you know, when, when I'm commissioning art, uh, we own all the originals. And so we have a traveling gallery show. And it goes all over the country. Uh, and it's become a really powerful vehicle, a catalyst for having conversations about seed and conversations about food and connecting with people who've never thought about where their food comes from and especially not even where their seeds come from. So it goes to farming conferences, it goes to flower shows, it goes to nature centers, it goes to uh, uh, big uh, public gatherings, it goes to art galleries, uh, places that people don't normally get to have conversations and really dig deeper uh, into what it means to plant a seed. So I'm going to share a couple stories that, uh, and show how the artists were telling the stories of these varieties. And these are kind of in chronological order a little bit, too, in terms of how old these stories are. So corn, when I think about corn, of course, I think about Teosinte, and I think about central Mexico, and I think about uh, ownership. Who owns seed? And you know, when we are talking about genetic engineering and we're talking about uh, IP issues, uh, a lot of what's going on is this idea that somehow, because you change something in some way, that you now own it. And that if you own it, if you own this seed, then no one else should have access to that seed story. So the seeds have a genetic story. The genetic story is 10 or 12,000 years of coevolution with humans. And when you plant that seed and it starts to grow, it's expressing that genetic story. Who owns that story? You know, the latest corporation or the latest seed breeder to come around and change it in some small way or even in some large way. Or the cultures, if someone was going to own it, it would be the cultures that turned Teosinte into one of the world's most important food crops and nutritious food crops. Uh, so there was an artist uh, who submitted a work of art. The artists don't know the varieties that I'm looking for. I just do portfolio reviews. Uh, about 400 artists apply every year um, to create art for us. So this artist actually submitted an old map of the North and South with an illustration of Abraham Lincoln, a portrait of him in ink on top of that map. And so he was telling the story of uh, one person's impact uh, geographically and socially. Uh, and so I thought he was the right artist to tell the story of corn. And so he worked with this map of central Mexico and did the illustration uh, of our uh, blue jay dwarf sweet corn uh, right on top. So this is what the pack looks like. This is producing the corn. It's a dwarf corn uh, on our property. We like kind of weird varieties um, because we like to think about who's growing our varieties and what their needs are. And so we have a lot of rooftop farmers and urban farmers who would like to grow sweet corn, and they can't grow the full-size large uh, corns. They don't have enough space. Um, there's weight issues. There's, there's wind issues. Uh, and so this corn actually wound up being a really great fit for urban growers uh, because of its short stature, uh, and it's still a good producer. Uh, and also at market, it really stands out. It's this uh, light blue, pale blue when you harvest it, and it turns indigo when you steam it. Uh, and this is uh, the corn at its fresh stage, drying on the farm. And then this is our hand crank shelling uh, corn sheller uh, that we run everything through uh, when we're processing the seed. The other thing I've encountered over, the over time is people really want to hear the kind of 
beautiful, romantic travel stories that come with seeds and, you know, about great grandma so-and-so who came over from uh, Italy. And they're really be there's beautiful, beautiful stories that come with seeds, but there's also difficult stories. And I don't think we should uh, necessarily pick and choose just the nice stories that we want to hear. Um, this is a really interesting uh, story. This is Pippin's Golden Honey Pepper. And it was a variety that was given to a farmer who also kept bees um, in the 1930s by a fairly famous African-American folk artist named Horace Pippin. And Horace Pippin had a injury that he called the miseries, which was probably an uh, arthritic condition. And the folk remedy for that was to be stung by a bee. So he made friends with his neighbor, who was a farmer who kept bees, and said, can I come and get stung um, to alleviate the, the pressure um, and get that remedy? And the farmer said, you can, but I lose a bee every time you come over uh, to do that. So what are you going to give me uh, as barter for this treatment? And so Horace started bringing him vegetables and seeds from his garden. And many of those varieties are varieties that came to America with slaves. And so, you know, these are some of the more difficult stories uh, that I think are important to think about when we think about where do seeds come from and what does it mean to be a seed steward, not just of that genetic story, but also of that cultural story of who those seeds came with. And especially right now when we think about um, everything that's happening with uh, immigration uh, and changing attitudes or, or unearthed attitudes that have been there a long time about immigrants, our diversity we owe to immigrants. And whether those people came here because they chose to come here or they were kidnapped from their homes and forcibly brought here, they brought seeds with them because culturally that was the most important thing that they could bring to make sure that wherever they wound up they had something familiar something that would feed them culturally as well as physically. Uh, and so I think it's important to, to think about these stories as well. Uh, so this is uh, Hank's Extra Special Baking Bean, which is a very local story. I'm not going to go into that too much, but that's Peg Lotvin, who's the daughter of Hank, which is where the seeds came from. She comes to our farm uh, during harvest time every year to continue what her father did, which is choose the selections uh, for planting the next year to keep that, maintain that variety the way that her father was. It's a variety that we celebrated through a program we have called Kitchen Cultivars, where we connect uh, seeds to farmers, to chefs, um, to sort of create that value chain uh, and celebrate varieties that uh, we think uh, are important to our region. Um, and actually, Hank's extra special baking bean wound up in the New Yorker magazine because of the program, which was really exciting for a very humble uh, bean. You know, people don't really think about dry beans that much. They don't get excited about dry beans, usually unless they're like colorful and jewel-like. And this is just like a plain white, you know, um, bean. But uh, it wound up having a whole new life um, through celebrating the story and not just the commodity of it. So over time, I've really come to believe that artists are cultural seed stewards and seed breeders are agricultural artists. And one of the people that uh, has really, uh, I had a conversation with that really inspired me uh, was Molly John. Uh, when she was at Cornell, she worked on uh, creating uh, Cornell's Bush Delicata. And uh, through uh, neglect in some ways of an open pollinated variety by some larger producers, uh, the quality of the delicata started going downhill. We got the original seeds from Michael Mazurik from the original breeding program, and we've been working on um, bringing that variety back uh, the way that it was introduced um, by Molly. And so I called her to have a conversation about the process of creating the variety. And I was expecting to have a conversation that was just going to be like over my head about seed breeding because she's kind of phenomenal. And the first thing she said to me, she's like in the airport flying off to London or something, and there's all this noise. And the first thing she says to me is about how seed breeding is an art form. 
And I was like, okay, this is cool. Um, I'm not the only one who thinks this way. Even someone who's really steeped in science and in sort of the ivory tower world of uh, university breeding recognizes that there's artistry to this, that we can't just do this with pure science, that we have to also use all of our senses um, and think uh, culturally about this as well. So this is growing, this is the artist working on the variety. And just to look at the artwork, so when I choose the artist, I tell them the story of that seed. So I told um, Sarah, uh, the artist here, the story of the interview with Molly and what Molly said about being an artist. And so that's where this illustration comes from, is the artist is saying, you know, both showing the act of creating the artwork with the hand and the paintbrush, mm -hmm. as well as the act of uh, pollinating with a paintbrush, which some, uh, some hand pollinators use paintbrushes, not all of us. Um, and so it's that simultaneous uh, art uh, and science um, happening at the same time. But one of the other things, um, back to what I was saying, is about how do we steward seeds in a way that feels responsible uh, as a seed company when we're selling seeds. Uh, we're a very, very small seed company, and I think in some ways that allows us to do things a little bit differently than some of the larger seed companies. Uh, so when we're doing uh, seed production for something like uh, Delicata, the food is ripe at the same time as the seeds. It's not true of all of the plants that we work with. But when it is true, to us it feels really wasteful uh, not to do something with that food. And on a small scale, you know, we eat really well, our employees eat really well, our neighbors and our families eat really well. Sometimes we have much more than we can share with our immediate uh, friends and neighbors. And that was the case with the delicata. I uh, had about 2,000 delicata squash. Uh, no, I don't have enough friends <laughs> um, to, to move all of that. Uh, and so we began partnering with soup kitchens and food banks. And so what we do now is we actually drive the, the uh, fruit to the soup kitchen. We've trained the employees and volunteers at the soup kitchens on how to harvest uh, for our needs because we don't want people slicing right through uh, the delicata and damaging seeds. So we've taught them how to cut through the outside and twist them open. We're getting the seeds. And it's, the, it's kind of amazing timing for the soup kitchens. Thanksgiving is the busiest time of year uh, at a soup kitchen. And so these are ripe and ready right around that time. So we can go to the soup kitchen, uh, we can harvest the seeds right there, and then they can put everything uh, in the cooler or even start cooking them right then. And then our community uh, where people are really in need of uh, healthy food um, have access to uh, certified organic gourmet Cornell Bush delicata squash and other foods. Uh, to me, that's part of, so like I was saying, when you plant the seed, it's growing that genetic story and it's also you're experiencing the cultural story, but you're part of that story. That act of planting that seed means you're the next chapter. You're the next paragraph. Maybe you're the next word. Whatever it is, you've become part of that story. And so this is one of our ways of continuing the story of this variety. Um, so interestingly, you brought up La Prairie. Mm -hmm. And so this is... Um, this is another version of uh, untangling a hybrid. And I'll just talk about how the artist interpreted that. Um, so I told this artist the whole story of uh, working with a hybrid and untangling the genetics um, to create a new variety. Ours is called Bridge to Paris Pepper. Uh, and so the artist did a few things here. One is uh, you see the levitating sliced pepper. So the artist was really thinking about keen observation and how closely um, you have to look at the varieties and think about um, all of that diversity to do your selection work. Uh, then he did the drawer there with the pearls spilling out. And that was his interpretation of thinking about that tangle, that genetic tangle, and sort of opening this Pandora's box and this tangle spilling out, um, but also the value of that tangle. Um, and the value of thinking about uh, the importance of 
this genetic diversity being accessible for everyone. Um, so just that simple opening the drawer. And I don't know if you've noticed also, I looked at this painting for years and I've had this seed pack for years and I never noticed this until I was giving a talk and I shared this and someone pointed out the shape of the drawer unit there is the Arc de Triomphe. Yeah. And that yeah. First time. And so right. that was reference to um, La Paris. Uh, as the original variety. So our artists really listen to the stories and I really, it, it, it's always surprising to me even though I try and be controlling because I am a little bit controlling <laughs> with the artist because it has to work. Um, it has to be something that's gonna work on the pack. But I really give them a lot of freedom to interpret those stories. And one more quick story. So there's also ecological stories and especially coming to a conference like Organicology, um, where most organic farmers that I've met aren't choosing to grow organic um, because they think it's just going to be a great market for them. Um, they're thinking about larger issues and the impact that their farm has on the natural environment, that organic farms are part of natural ecosystem. And so there's certain varieties that we work with and we steward not because of their potential uh, commodity impact um, or that there's a market for selling that uh, variety, um, but because of their role in natural ecosystem. And milkweed is one of those. This is one of the only, actually this is the only work of art I've ever gotten a complaint about. Uh, and you know, usually people are just like really into the art and it's beautiful and it's inspiring and all of that. This I got an email uh, and the email said, I'm really, really disappointed in the artwork for the milkweed because the butterfly is black and white. And, you know, milkweed is all about the relationship with monarchs. And the reason that we're encouraging people to grow milkweed and we added it to the catalog is because we've lost uh, close to 80% of the monarch population because of losing milkweed. And so the more habitat we can create, we can save monarchs from extinction. So she was saying, it's black and white, it should be orange. Uh, that's what makes them iconic, that's what makes them memorable, that's what inspires people to care about them. And you know, to me, that's just like a perfect teachable moment. Of, so I wrote back, um, what I wanted to write, which I didn't write, uh, was, you know, Nancy Bloom's an amazing artist. She didn't just run out of orange crayons that day. Um, she didn't just run out of time and say, who cares, I'm sending this in even though it's not done. Um, what I did write was that artists make very careful decisions about their artwork and what they're saying with their artwork. And so Nancy made, it, obviously she can work with color, you know, she has no trouble with that. So why would Nancy Bloom choose to create a monarch butterfly that's black and white. What is she trying to say? What do you think? She's doing exactly that, exactly what the woman was reacting to, that what do we stand to lose here? You know, this is like a ghostly disappearing monarch and that's what's happening. Um, so there's all kinds of stories to tell with seeds. Um, and not everyone gets them all right away, which is fine. Um, the cool thing about the milkweed, uh, the year that we started growing it for seed, um, I thought it would take the monarchs a while to find us. It was like, if you grow it, they will come kind of thing. We started growing it, and that season uh, we had monarchs. Uh, I'm going to wrap up with this quote, and then I have one more quick story. Uh, this is one of the quotes that really is at the heart of uh, how we work with seeds. This is a small corner of our seed farm, by the way. Seeds have the power to preserve species, to enhance cultural as well as genetic diversity, to counter economic monopoly, and to check the advance of conformity on all its many fronts. That's from Michael Pollan. The last story I want to leave you with uh, is this. So this experience um, 
I worked with uh, Haudenosaunee Iroquois uh, community in northern New York at the Aquasasne Reservation uh, with, uh, in partnership with Rowan White, who many of you may know, uh, to work on saving some of the sacred seed varieties of the Iroquois nations. This was the most powerful experience I have ever had working with seeds in my life. And every time I talk about it in front of people, I get to the point where I have to stop talking. So I apologize in advance if I get choked up. Uh, but not all seeds are ours to sell. Not all seeds are ours to commodify or put into a catalog just because they wound up in our hands. And I think this this is an important reminder for all of us because we are focused on this commodity world. We have to make a living. Um, but depending on the stories that come with the seeds, we have to respect those stories and the ancestry and the lineage of those stories sometimes and not just think, because I have the power to grow this and save seeds from it, it's mine. Uh, and so this is an important story uh, and lesson for me around that. Um, it, it, the amount of trust uh, and relationship building that it took to get to the point where um, the folks from Aquasasne entrusted us with their sacred varieties to grow them out um, was a big part of the grow out, not just the grow out itself. And this is Rowan um, when she brought the seeds. Uh, and we worked with a whole bunch of different communities to make this happen. So we worked with uh, three different groups from Aquasasne. We had kids come up from the Bronx um, uh, with their moms to do some of the planting. Uh, we worked with the Mexican farm workers at the uh, Hudson Valley Farm Hub, which is a 1,400-acre <coughs> nonprofit farm that uh, funded uh, this project and gave us the space to do it. Uh, and we worked with many of the members of our Hudson Valley community, mostly most of whom uh, were white and middle or upper mi middle, middle class. Uh, we did the Sarah, uh, uh, Kenny Perkins, uh, Tina Square and Rowan came and blessed the land and did the seed songs and the ceremonies for planting. Uh, and then we grew a, a four sisters garden and then we also did a uh, quarter acre of Mohawk red bread corn. These are the Onondaga sunflowers in the four sisters garden. And throughout the season, there was a real mixture of people from all different backgrounds helping stored these varieties and grow these varieties. And the cultural exchange that happened throughout the season, uh, I think was one of the most powerful parts of the experience. That people who don't normally get to talk to each other or be with each other, uh, you know, most people have never worked side by side with a Mexican migrant farm worker. Never had that experience. Um, and so these were the varieties. It was a, a Canadian crookneck, a uh, brown buckskin bean, which is a pole bean, a mystery squash, which was supposed to be one thing um, that Rowan collected from one of the elders at one of the Iroquois uh, communities that we're still trying to identify, the uh, Onondaga sunflower and the Mohawk red bread corn. And then we had two uh, harvest days uh, where everyone came down who was involved. Uh, what was interesting about these varieties and powerful about them, when I say they're sacred varieties, it's because they were connected to specific cultural practices, specific ceremonies, specific foods that are only served at certain times of the year for very certain reasons. And that's why these aren't to be commodified and just grown for any reason. And we weren't growing them for the food necessarily from it. We we're growing them as part of a cultural restoration program at Aquasasne, where youth are learning their language, their ceremonies, their songs, the rituals. And without these seeds and without these foods, they really can't experience those cultural ceremonies. So a, we learned how to braid corn, which is wonderful. There were two ears of the Mohawk red bread corn left when we started this program. In the end, we were able to rematriate 800 pounds of the corn. So this is where I lose it. 
So what happened was all of this corn went back to the reservation. And for the longhouse ceremony, this was the, I'm not going to be able to do it. <laughs> so I'm going to wrap it up here. I'll just leave you with a beautiful picture. We can talk about it. I don't know what it is about talking about it in front of people like this that makes it difficult for me. I can have this conversation over dinner um, with no problem. Um, but what I want to end with, because I think it is time to end, seeds are alive. And when you hold that little tiny seed in your hand, it's easy to forget that it's a living being and that you are caring for it. And so I want to remind all of us, whether you're a farmer or a gardener or a producer or a wholesaler, uh, wherever you are in this value chain, you are taking care of a living being. And I think that's, I'm just going to leave it there. And thanks so much.